Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. Homosexuals have contributions to make to society. It's a shame because I think there's more to Justin Fashionu than his sexuality. A nail bomb went off tonight in a crowded gay bar in Soho. We are seeing hate crime rise continuously. One in five football fans think that homophobic chanting is just banter. We're no different than anybody else. So to hear the homophobic chant, that's what hurts. Football stadiums can be a law unto themselves. It is simply not true that intersexual people suffer in a way that other people don't suffer. If you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say anything. When I started to realize, okay, this is something I can't really hide from. It's a sin. Football belongs to the fans. Football belongs to the communities. Football gives a sense of belonging, which you just don't get anywhere else in society nowadays. It's a place where you can feel that you're part of something bigger. It's the talking point, you know, whether you're in school, whether you're in the office, whether you're in the pub, whether you're on WhatsApp. It's the sport everyone has an opinion about. You want to be part of that. It's being part of a crowd who are all there sharing an experience. That shared experience, the human emotion that you go through being part of something collective like that is really powerful. It just brings people together, like you can see it in stadiums. It is a really family feel, big environment, people can get involved. If you're part of a family, and football is a family, and there's someone within your family that holds a prejudice or bigotry towards you, then that's always going to be heartbreaking. I'd known that I was transgender since I was about seven years old, and I, I, I struggled through my life with self-harming, suicidal ideation. And suddenly I, I realised why I hated myself so much. I think it was about 45 or so when, when I did finally transition. And at the time Bournemouth were pushing for promotion to the Premier League, we were playing back-to-back -back away games, I think at Doncaster and Leeds or, or somewhere up, up in that area. And I was in, uh, of all places, the Hotel Ibis Budget in Bradford uh, to have my epiphany moment, I looked out the window and it's like, it was like this light bulb went off. I remember one Friday I went to see my hairdresser here in Brighton about getting hair extensions and she said, I can do it now. And she starts putting them in and all of a sudden I went, I've got to go take photos of footballers on Monday morning. I can't really pretend to still be Steve with a full head of hair. They're going to wonder how the fat bald bloke became this vision of loveliness. So I went in for this meeting at the club. We're in the owner's box overlooking the pitch. There's the, the chairman of the club, Jeff Mostyn. There's, there's uh, the commercial manager. There's Eddie Howe, our first team manager. There's um, Jason Tindall, the assistant manager, and me in my pencil skirt and heels looking absolutely fabulous. And uh, first thing that happened was I still had a job, which I really wasn't expecting because I'd never been a trans person working in football before. And then Eddie Howe said to me, what can I do to make this easier for you? When you come out, you can't expect everyone to understand straight away, but if your boss says, what can I do to make it easier, then that's all you can hope for. And I said, well, I need to meet the players before a match day. So it was arranged for me to go in and photograph a training session uh, a couple of days later, and the boys were all off warming up, and Eddie Howe came up to me and said, uh, he's scared. And I said, you know what, for the first time in my life, I'm totally at ease with who I am, so no, I'm not scared. They called all the players together in a circle, and Jason Tindall, the assistant manager, stood up and said, suppose you noticed our photographer's changed a bit since last season. I'd like you all to meet Sophie. And then our captain, Tommy Elphick, just started clapping, and the rest of the guys joined in. And then Tommy said, right, let's go and train. And I'm like, was that it? I built this up so much. This was like a life-changing moment. 
And it's like, I mean, looking back now, it, it was the perfect response because, OK, here's a new piece of information. We've got it. Now let's move on. And the thing is, when someone comes out, unless it directly affects you, all it is is a new piece of information. And yet we live in a society where people don't only feel that they've got the right to comment on it, but quite often that they feel obliged to. I mean, how often do you hear someone say, well, I really don't want to say this, but I feel that I have to. It's like, well, you don't. If you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say anything. No matter how much you feel part of what's going on with, with, with the team, with the, with the other fans, you've just scored a goal, you're all celebrating, if someone next to you shouts homophobic abuse at a player, immediately that has othered you. Immediately that has ripped you out of that family where you all belong together and ma made you feel different, made you feel unwanted. That's quite offensive because we have jobs, we pay taxes, we contribute to society, you know, we've, we're good family members, we're no different than anybody else. So to hear the put down through a, through a homophobic chant, that's what hurts. We don't want homophobes at games chanting the most awful comments sometimes, uh, you know, making comments about a player's perceived sexuality, what they might do off the pitch. And, and it's not relevant. It's not about football. In 2021, we are seeing hate crime towards LGBTQ plus people rise continuously. Uh, those figures increase if we're talking about the trans community, 200% increase in hate crimes against the trans community in the last five years. Our recent report that we did with Outsport, which is from 2019, so it's a couple of years ago now, showed that of the LGBT people that they surveyed, 88% of them had witnessed some form of homophobia in a sporting environment. Uh, in a sa same survey, we found that one in five football fans think that homophobic chanting is just banter. <laughs> I was at a game in the Premier League only this season where I was actually sat in, in the home end um, watching a Manchester United game repeatedly. Every time Cristiano Ronaldo got the ball, it was, you faggot. That was, I think that was basically an attempt to, you know, to, to, to criticise Ronaldo, an attempt to bring Ronaldo down in some way, an attempt to, in the same way that any kind of perceived weakness is used. Um, and that's obviously no reflection on Cristiano Ronaldo himself, but it shows how homophobic language can be used as a way of trying to attack a player. I think it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing um, for a lot of LGBTQ plus people when they're coming to terms with themselves and, and willing to sort of express who they are in, in, in their lives. Um, the, the sort of fear of going to, to football and that collective experience that everyone else gets to be a part of. You know, when you go to a football game and your team scores a goal, you can hug strangers, you can share that with people you've never met before and it feels completely normal and natural because all of you are there for that shared idea, for that shared purpose, for following that team. Having that thought to deal with that you might in some way not be welcomed, that you might be excluded from an experience that at a modern top level football stadium, tens of thousands of people uh, are being part of just because of who you are, it's, it's horrendous. For me, it goes back to when I was at school and, and I was forced to play rugby and, and the rugby pitch and me didn't get on. And even the, 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 the teacher would shout obscenities at me <laughs> to you know, be more masculine. You know, you know, fern, stop being a fairy. You know, don't be a puff. And these are the things that teachers said in the 70s, OK? And that resonated with me at the time. And it's only in recent years that I've sort of thought back on that period because those comments were being made to me because I was perceived as not being, you know, manly enough. Um, and I was made to pay the price for that by being humiliated in front of my classmates. Football was not something I felt like I would want to get involved in actually physically attending the games. When you go to a football game, and certainly five, ten years ago, you didn't want to be seen as being different. You had to sort of blend in. You had to be a little bit of a chameleon. 
when the Emirates opened up, I looked and I went, that's one hell of a stadium. I think I want to go and see this stadium. And I actually came to a game. I literally came in at the last minute and sat just up there overlooking it. And I got that experience of the large stadium, but we lost. <laughs> we lost 2-1 and I never felt so deflated, but I'd had that experience. But around me, there was a lot of chanting sort of going on that I personally didn't feel comfortable with. Quite by chance on the internet, I saw this uh, article about the Gay Gooners and Arsenal, and there was a membership link, you know, join here for free. Gay Gooners to me, it, it, it's got more and more important in my life because part of me is like making up for lost time, not coming here more often, but the interaction before and after the games when we have gatherings, you know, members get together, we chat about the game. We're just like any other football fans, but there's a, there's a certain almost like family connection within the group. We're in a safe space. For me, the big thing that, that delayed me coming out was the fact that I, I just didn't know that I had a place in this world as, as a post-transition me. Um, and I, I think that's difficult for, for a lot of LGBT people because they see so much hatred and so, so much prejudice in society. It's like, well, um, when I come out, am I going to be vilified? Am I going to be attacked? Am I going to be abused? I appeared on Newsnight and within an hour of appearing on there, I'd had over 1,000 abusive messages on Twitter, including death threats. It becomes dangerous because you may say these things and you may think they're just words, but eventually someone's gonna, someone's gonna listen to these words and act on it physically. So sad that you're leaving. It takes time to believe it. There's been so many innuendos and rumours and this, that and the other going on about my sexuality and about me over the years. I'm in a situation where I've been honest. It's not something which you want to, to say. It's not something that you want to be. It's, it's a fact that that's a fact and you have to deal with it. Um, I should be judged on my football inability and anything else. Do you think it's damaged your chances? Because uh, football supporters, apart from anything else, uh, seize on anything to, to have a go. To that's not a problem. Yeah. It, um, the ridicule and all that type of thing, I don't have a problem with. Mm. What I'm having a problem with at the moment is um, the, the soccer authority saying, well, hold on a minute, uh, we called up a couple of clubs and they're saying, well, a fit just in fashion we'd definitely like to have, but he's too hot to handle at the moment. As you know, in the newspapers, they made a big deal out of it and put things in which weren't um, agreed on. You think that you've got them sussed and you have lawyers there and you have all these people who are going to safeguard you, but they never do. Doors are not being opened because of the, the sexuality, and I, I just don't think that's right. The former footballer Justin Fashionu has been found dead in a garage in East London. It's understood he died of strangulation. He was 37. I do remember it. And at the time, I actually couldn't talk to anybody about my feelings about it because I didn't... I was living in a straight world, I had a straight job, um, was deeply in the closet. Was, so for me, that, that, that was, I remember it distinctly and just thinking, wow, that is, is beyond sad. You know, and the way it was portrayed in the press as well was, was, was horrible. We're only talking about in the 70s, articles in, in national newspapers telling their readers how to spot a queer, basically. And yes, that stuff has been incredibly damaging in, in real people's lives. That's had in, extremely impactful and painful and tragic consequences for people. A lot of the stories at the time for, for gay men, because we had the AIDS crisis and, 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 and that didn't help in terms of perception. You know, there was a negativity very much towards the gay community, which, which in itself forced me even deeper into the closet. You know, scared. You went out and met somebody, you might get a disease. It, it was that scary. So for Justin, 
I couldn't talk to anybody about it because I, I didn't have that group. I think unfortunately, and it feels horrible to say it, but I think it's the reality. I think anyone who is different in professional football has to expect, because this is the way the world appears to be, a certain amount of intimidation or abuse, whether that's online or from the stands. It's not right, but that is what all the evidence of the past few years is telling us. You had England players missing penalties in the final of the Euros and being racially abused for it within, within an hour, right? So this idea that football can ever promise to provide a perfectly safe environment for LGBT people is impossible. As long as social media exists in the current way it does, that is impossible. When I've spoken to anybody from the gay community, it's like, that's the element that they don't want. They don't want the witch hunt. And some people aren't prepared or primed up to be able to be under the spotlight as intensely as what the media would like it to be. So every single person, every single player, um, coach, wherever it may be within the football community we're talking about, that is going to come out or, or, or may feel like they want to come out, they've got to look at so many different layers to this, to this conversation, so many layers to the, what are the permutations when they come out um, and the uncontrollables, that it makes it very, very, very difficult. Someone like Robbie Rogers, who, you know, at the time where he came out, he chose to step away from the game and then came, and then came back into it. Thomas Hitzelsberger came out after he retired and obviously Justin Fashion, who took his own life. Um, so I think, actually, you know, those three examples, you know, for me growing up as a, as a teenager, it was like, OK, well, here's three people who were gay, who are gay in, in football, and they've concluded that either this industry or this life is not a place for them. I truly believe that when I came out, it was going to be the end of my involvement in the game because there'd never been a transgender person working openly within the game. I think for me, as someone who covers football professionally, it was honestly quite terrifying, the thought of, of coming out publicly, because I sincerely didn't know if I was going to be able to continue to have a career in something. I didn't know if it was going to be so excluded that I wouldn't be able to, to come to stadiums and feel comfortable doing the work that I do, the work that I love, the work that I've been doing, um, gosh, most of my professional life, really. It wasn't really until my story broke in the tabloids that, that people started coming up and I'd have fans coming up to me and shaking my hand saying, oh my God, I'm so glad you can be happy. And, and sort of, I remember one game we were playing Man City and this woman ran all the way down from the back of the stand, which uh, Bournemouth isn't very far. She tapped me on the shoulder and went, oh my God, you look amazing. It's like, oh, thanks. I strongly believe that every time one of us comes out and, and has a positive response, it helps the next person. When I started to realize my sexuality more like in, in high school, around like, I'd say 13, 14, 15 years old, when I started to really realize, okay, this is something I can't really hide from forever. And this is something that, 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 that very much is real to me. But more so I was, I was just thinking like, there's no way I'm gonna let this stop me from being a professional. I was at a point in my life where I was very content because I had been out to my family and my friends. Um, my teammates have supported me. Um, I had come out to a few people in my previous club in DC, at DC. And then when I was in Minnesota, I was like super supported by everyone there. Um, not only did I have teammates that knew, I had the coaches knew and uh, the front office people knew, but I didn't necessarily have to tell anyone. It was just very easy to me. It took a, a friend kind of nudging me and, and, and letting me know that it, it was actually potentially could be a big deal and you could help a lot of people. Once I kind of got the idea creeped in my head, it, it felt like, you know, I, I would, looking back on it, I'd be pretty upset if I didn't come out while I was playing because all, all these people have shown me that they're supporting me. It's not a big deal. If I can help another person that's maybe going through this, like I got to do that, you know?
I cannot stress enough the importance of seeing role models who look like you, who speak like you, who play football like you, who also exist in the same sexualities and identities that you do, playing the game that you love, uh, coaching the game that you love, talking about the game that you love on, on television, wherever it is. Um, seeing those role models makes you realise that you can be seen in this sport and you can be safe to be in this sport. One of the reasons that I struggled with my mental health around my, my trans identity was the fact that I felt totally isolated, that I felt like I was the only person in the world that had ever been through this. I mean, th this was 2015, we, we still hadn't seen things like, like the, the massive response to rainbow laces, um, we didn't have any gay footballers. It was just a stage where, where football was just about to reach a tipping point and, and transition, like, like myself. I think visibility is so important and I also think it's such a, a burden sometimes that people don't realise that when you are being visible, if you are trying to wear the responsibility of representing a whole um, community even isn't necessarily the right word, like a whole category of, 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 of humanity, it's it's very weighty. Just because I am a transgender woman and I work in football journalism does not mean that I have um, the authority to speak for all transgender women. Sometimes, you know, coming out is, what does my family think? What do my friends think? Am I in a relationship with a woman? As things stand, do I have children? Um, but there's a lot of different factors. It could be religion. It could be all manner of different societal uh, personal working environment factor. So everyone's individual circumstance will be different. I genuinely thought if one person comes out, everyone will come out because he's made it comfortable, made it known that it is OK. I've had support. I haven't been absolutely destroyed by the public or the fans and the terraces. The change room have been brilliant. So it's going to be all right for everyone. It's not one size fits all. It's always going to be that like every individual will deal with it differently, but they'll be received differently as well. And you just like to think that more often than not, the situation will be dealt with right. Being an athlete, like, you know that you're gonna have so much scrutiny regardless, you know? I think it's just a bit harder for people that are trying to understand their sexuality while they play a sport, because like, for my straight colleagues, like, they're not going through some of the stuff that I had to go through, you know? Like, when I was first, first second year pro, like, there, there came a point where maybe my, my, all of my focus wasn't on my game, you know, like it, some of it was on like, okay, I got to figure out this part of me and I haven't had a, a partner and I haven't had some of these experiences that other people have had for years now before me, you know, so I'm playing a little bit of a catch up in my social life, um, in, in, in my life offside, outside the field that a lot of my straight teammates just didn't have to do. I knew it wouldn't be easy. I knew there was going to be parts of it that, that, that I didn't want to have to deal with. There was going to be uh, more attention on me that I, I probably didn't need. I was in a good place mentally where I could be like, you're about to receive a ton of, ton of stuff, negative, positive. People are going to start loving you now for, for reasons that you have no idea. They're going to start loving you. People are going to say some really messed up things to you. It was the last game of the regular season. We needed to win the game in order to be in the playoffs. We were up 3-1, uh, and it was right towards the end of the, the first half, and basically we were about to take a free kick, and um, uh, a player on the other team came up to me, and uh, we kind of exchanged some words, um, and then he, he called me a bati boy, which I knew was like basically faggot. Basically, I told the ref, I was like, hey, ref, this is what this guy just said to me. Um, be great if you could do something about it. <laughs> And um, the ref actually, at the time, he thought I called him gay. So he gave me a red card. And um, of course, my, my teammates immediately came, came over and were like, what's going on here? No, like, our player's gay. Like, of course he didn't call you gay. And uh, then at that time, I ran over to my coaches and I, and, and I told my coach, I said, hey, this is what happened. The ref got confused. He gave me a red card. And I just told him I'm not getting off the field. 
obviously I'm not, I'm not leaving the field. And from there, my coach was very swift and just making sure that something was done. I misunderstood because he was accusing the other guy of calling him. And I heard him call, I misinterpreted it as him calling the other guy. No, I'm telling you, he, I heard your player saying that. I, I understand that. Listen, player. that's why I'm rescinding the red oh, card. I heard that word and I sent it to me. I don't act dumb. You know what that means. I don't understand. Rick, this is his problem. Rick, this is beyond. This is guys, what Junior did last week. Okay, so like, let's, this is beyond soccer. Guys, Just this is soccer. this is what's going on. No, no. It was a really difficult, probably 20 minutes, because our players, in the heart of the moment and the passion of the moment, still wanted to play. I mean, they were kicking Phoenix's ass, right? And that's a great feeling as a soccer player. But if we want to be true to who we are as a club, um, we have to speak and we have to act. We have to get this out of our game. No, no, they're not gay. It's not racism, they're racism. They're gay. competing. It's How long have you been playing soccer? Guys, listen, Rick, this is what's going to happen. The red card you're is rescinded. I don't, I don't understand what the, your player said to him. They Andrew took here. offense to it, and I heard what him do you use do? the this word gay. I heard he him called him gay. The word. He called so Colin gay. Result, I misunderstood. I thought his player was calling your player. I can't Colin. go through this again, man. Nothing was done, and so we at halftime said, if nothing's going to be done, we're not going to play the game. And I personally, it was a decision that I, it was a bit overwhelming. I didn't want to do that because I was like, this is already way too much for me. Can we just finish the game and, and we'll deal with the, what, what happened after? Our guys, to their immense credit, just said, we're not going to stand for this. They were very clear in that moment that they were giving up all hopes of making the playoffs, even though they're beating um, one of the best teams in the league handedly. But they said it, it doesn't matter. There's things more important in life, and we have to stick up for, for what we believe in. And so they made the decision to walk off. Homophobia, racism. Right. Guys, he no said, listen, he said support. something Rick, in a language that I don't understand. I know understand. exactly what it, I can do what for you. I don't okay. have to make him, means gay. Means, I, means gay. I don't understand what that means. gay. Okay. I'm telling you what it means. Okay. It means gay. Okay. okay. I didn't hear that. We're going to decide what we're going to do. Okay. If you don't send him off, it's probably not hey, gay. Among a really hard moment and a, and a crazy way to end the year, it was an amazing show of support from my coach, my teammates, the club. And um, I think that message resonated with a lot of people that were watching. I started playing for Everton when I was really young, I was 16. I think at the time I was exploring my sexuality. I never classed myself straight away as gay. You know, I had boyfriends, I had girlfriends. For me, it was just a time to be able to explore and find out where I fitted, really. In school life, I think probably that's where I found things harder because I had a, went to an all-girls school. I had a group of friends, every single one of them um, was heterosexual. I had no one really to talk to about it. So the minute I got to football, it was like, ah, I can breathe. I can be me and I can be open, I can be free. Growing up in, in that environment, I classed my teammates as my family. I, I really did. and. I could say anything to them whenever I wanted. I probably spent most of my time with them more than anything. Okay. Ah, and to have those people in the changing room, like I can think of them in my head now, a lot of teammates around me, I didn't ever feel uncomfortable. I always felt like it, it wasn't even a taboo, it wasn't even a thing because there were so many players within the dressing room that had all gone through the same thing, all gone through those experiences it kind of just felt natural and it, it felt okay that we could have those conversations amongst ourselves. Sometimes it would be a joke, sometimes it would be a laugh, but it would never be scrutinized, it would never be an issue or a problem. Yay, clever boy. So I never felt that burden on me not to be able to express myself. Cheeky monkey. Like Stevie G when he kissed the camera. <laughs> The power of those role models that exist now in the in the WSL, um, across all of women's football actually, in the grassroots, just allows young people to see that and say, that could be me one day, that could be me, I'm accepted, I can do this whilst also being my true self. I look at women's football and I see 
lesbian women who are thriving in that sport, who are at the top of that sport, right? They are head coaches, they are star players, uh, they are shining examples. You don't yet see that, you know, at the very top of, of, of men's football. Um, that's just the reality of it. At the moment, we're not even, we're barely seeing survive, never mind thrive. I think the answer to why um, there's more acceptance within the women's game compared to the men's game is really complicated and, and has lots of layers to it. I think that probably there's some element of it, and, and I'm no sociologist, that is, but it, that it does come down to sociological forces of, um, I think that uh, femininity has been portrayed in, in media and society as weak and masculinity is strong and, and perhaps a stereotype of a gay male has been that they are feminine, which is, you know, a ridiculous stereotype in itself, but is nevertheless one that has been pushed in, in society and, and perhaps that in some way impacts this conversation and how um, the culture around football is, this sort of ultra macho culture. Probably it's been easier in some degree simply because the women's game has had a lower profile and so the amount of media attention that comes on people's personal relationships, the scrutiny is less which is, you know, sad to say because the women's game should have a higher profile. I think in women's football, the culture and the way it's, um, you know, it's, it, it is inclusive and it's open for everyone, but it's not just about your, your teammates and, you know, your, your people around in the dressing room. It's about higher up. So let's say management, coach and staff, um, people in the boardroom, all them type of people making sure that, you know, you feel safe and you feel comfortable enough to speak about who you are kind of thing and be yourself. The culture that the club promotes is that you can be yourself, you can be honest, you can be open, you can speak about anything here no matter no matter what it is. Um, and then that then filters down to the to the players and that's how then the dressing room then becomes more inclusive. We talk so much about why is there no gay player? Go and find me a gay male executive at the top of football. Are there people in these boardrooms who are, you know, directing policy and directing initiatives, um, who have, you know, that lived experience, um, or are they having to take it on board from outside? And is that advice from outside listened to as much as it should be? Are we providing the best possible environment for someone to be themselves? And if any way in the answer to that is no, then they are failing. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. All of those children are being cheated of a sound start in life. Yes, cheated. I grew up dealing with the, the Section 28 narrative about whether it was uh, uh, appropriate to even allow young people basically to be talked to about the fact that some people are gay and I think the coverage that happened at that time presenting it as though this was even a reasonable debate to be having, whether or not it was okay for people to, to talk about the reality of how they feel is, it's astonishing. I think if you thought about that in any other area of people's lives and um, mental health, that your response to people having a, a feeling within themselves would be don't talk about it is, it's cruel and outrageous. Because there was no, no players or, or, or people within the squads that I was in and most of the other squads in, in England at the time who had anybody visible or anybody who was out at that point. It was never a conversation really that was, was had. I often think of uh, current examples that I talk about all the time, Penilla Harder and Magda Eriksson at Chelsea, a very visible gay couple, talk about it all the time. One's a captain, one's a top striker. You think like, wow, if I was an 11 year old, 12 year old watching that, I never would have stopped playing football. And unfortunately, when I was 11 or 12 years old, I didn't have those role models to look up to at that time, or they weren't as, as accessible to me. And so I walked away from the sport of football.
having people out there speaking about it, having the rainbow laces, um, a little bit like taking a knee, taking a knee, having the rainbow laces, etc. Make sure people talk about it. And there could be a kid at home who's never spoken about, thought about, experienced anything to do with um, his sexuality. Ask the question at home, what's that armband about? Why is that captain of my club wearing that? Oh, then that sparks the conversation. I think that's vitally important. My role at the PFA, I've got a dual role. So I work on the equalities team. We deliver a lot of workshops. Um, around discrimination, around reporting, abuse, this type of thing. Um, a lot of it's to do with language as well, around the changing room, about how players speak to each other, what maybe was once deemed as banter. Maybe you can't say things like that anymore, and it's educating the players on what they can and can't say. That type of language was just commonplace um, in the environments that I grew up, and it wasn't ever challenged, it wasn't ever picked out and gone, actually, you know, you know what, that's wrong. Um, and that was probably the wrong thing, and it comes back to, to the time in which we're, where we are now in society where things have changed and it's moved on, uh, and people are being challenged, and I think only rightly so. That there's, you can't pick people out and say, you're this, you're that. And again, that comes back down to education. The same could be said about loads of different forms of discrimination. The landscape has changed massively, and it's about industries educating people, it's about the curriculum educating uh, young people as well to understand better so they can make the correct decisions. I'm not afraid to speak out sometimes if I feel people are in the wrong and um, I've just got to judge those situations very carefully. I think five or six years ago if I'd been at a football game I wouldn't say anything. If I heard anything I'd have just kept my mouth shut and been quite nervous to have actually said anything changed a bit now um, because there's more visibility, people are more understanding and you read various surveys, you know, upwards of 90% of, of fans that go regularly to Premier League games will have no issue with a player coming out, for example. And if they've got no issue with a player coming out, then they shouldn't have an issue about fans. You do get an initial comment sometimes like, oh, it's, it's banter or we've been chanting it for 20 years and, you know, why, why is it offensive? You know, and I explain. Invariably, it's very good. There's been one occasion where one guy had to be physically restrained from hitting me. Uh, that was actually in, in Baku. Um, all got sorted out in the end because the guy apologised uh, the, the next day. We're not out deliberately to try and call people out. That's, that's not what we're about. We just want to educate and say, think about it next time. And, you know, and hopefully they'll turn around and say, you know, that's not right because it's, it's not fair um, for, for people to hear that. When you see people using homophobic or racist abuse in grounds, well, one response could be, be to just ban them. But the thing that I like to see with, with so many clubs, and I've, I've seen it at Brentford recently and some great work being done by Marcus Gale there, where they actually take people in and they educate them because they want to keep going to football. And if you just ban them, they will just take that prejudice and, and, and still exhibit it in society, out in the streets. If you can use the fact that they want to keep going to, to, to football to sit them down and educate them why they shouldn't be racist, why they shouldn't be homophobic, then hopefully they can take that education back into society, hopefully exert some peer pressure on, on their, their social circle and cut the propagation of it. If you take the way that, for example, Raheem Sterling has spoken about racism, the way that Marcus Rashford spoke about child poverty and actually led the national discussion on that, carried the national discussion on that. I think in many senses, in terms of social awareness, football is, 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 is in some ways leading the way. I think the difficulty that football has with regards to homophobia is it doesn't really know how to handle this issue where it's far more about inclusion than discrimination. So in a situation where you know, Colin Martin receives abuse during a game or Josh Cavallo receives abuse online, those are really easy things for football to deal with because it can look at that and say, here's a bad bit of behaviour, no more of that. I think where it's more difficult is how do you foster an environment that is more inclusive so that more people feel comfortable?
When I first came out, obviously I was working at Bournemouth, but I was living in Bryan at the time and I started coming along to Whitehawk Football Club and it's a very unique club. It's on the outskirts of quite an affluent town, Brighton, but it's attached to one of the most deprived council estates in the country. And it already had this unique atmosphere caused by, by the, the unique demographics of the city. So the fans were singing homophobia, no racism, no sexism, no. We've got a, uh, a disco ball hanging in, in, the, in the home end, the din. Uh, we, we've got rainbow flags. We, we do so many amazing things. And I'm now here as the club's equality and diversity officer. And we just get involved in so many things. Like I now manage an LGBT uh, representative side called Rainbow Rovers. And we've played a couple of exhibition matches against ex-pros, uh, including some big names like Keith Gillespie, Lee Hendry. And it was it was great to just put a t team of uh, LGBT players out on the pitch. And I remember being in, in the change room and saying to my players before the game, the media is obsessed with when a gay player is going to come out, but I'm looking at a room full of them here. Let's go out there and show them what we can do. And we went out and we stuffed them 5-2. I'm lucky enough in my role to sit across many different wonderful partnerships that we have at Stonewall with different organisations and see the work that organisations are doing themselves to make the world better for LGBTQ plus people. And the Premier League and the FA have always been two real strong allies in delivering some of this work. Over the years, we've seen Premier League clubs grow in number and grow in support of uh, their kind of dedication to rainbow laces. And all year there will be clubs that want to tell us about rainbow badges that they've started stocking outside of Pride Month, about an activation that they're doing with a new training shirt to shine a light on their football versus homophobia month. We know homophobia is still happening in games, in stadiums. I guess what is heartening in that is that I think clubs now more than ever, in all my years of watching football, I think clubs themselves are calling it out in a way that we've just never seen before. I think it's um, a, a shockingly poorly thought through decision to allow a tournament to happen somewhere where the safety and um, possibility for all people to travel and participate in that tournament is not guaranteed. I feel like FIFA's turned a blind eye to make sure that this World Cup can go through in that location. So do I feel a personal vendetta to FIFA on just the LGBTQ uh, rights situation? I think it just, it, it, it's clear that it was probably the wrong decision on multiple levels, you know, not just this one. To take a tournament to a place where, you know, the consequences for being out as gay are, are, are horrific, I think it's a major concern for FIFA. But is it a concern because they really, really care about LGBT people or is it a concern because of the way it makes them look? You kind of got the impression it's like we'd rather you weren't there. Please don't come because, you know, you're not welcome. And FIFA haven't helped themselves because they could have nipped this in the bud um, a lot earlier. And even now, it's lip service. I, I, I hear that from the FA and FIFA, you know, that rainbow, you know, you'll be able to wear your rainbow scarf inside the stadium. But will you be able to wear your rainbow scarf outside the stadium and hold your boyfriend's hand while you walk into the stadium? And there's been no guarantees. I don't know, genuinely, whether it's safe for me to go to a World Cup in Qatar. And frankly, the, the noises that I've heard so far from the organising committee have made me feel less confident than I would be, rather than more. For transgender people, we're not making a choice on whether or not we're being publicly affectionate. We're making a choice on whether or not we can exist. There is still progress being made in the most progressive countries, you know? So how can we help a country that is way further behind in their ideologies, in their support, in their understanding, 
of of people that that maybe don't fit the mold they want. It's tough. We can continue to shame and shame a country like this, but I, I think that's probably not the right way. But what's the what's the right, right way? I think it's just to to make sure that these conversations are being had if the World Cup's going to be there. You know, if anybody's going to Qatar, just pack a rainbow flag, take it take it to the stadium, just push that envelope and say to the authorities, "We're here. We're not going away." People don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I think I'll be gay. It doesn't happen. People are born that way. We don't choose our sexuality, it's just who we are. I think football has done a lot to make things better, but they could, in my opinion, they could do a lot more. Football needs to be, you know, more forward thinking and, and really looking and thinking, are we doing absolutely everything possible? Every time we can send a positive message of inclusion, that really helps people that are going to be coming out. You go to lots of Premier League stadiums now, you'll see banners up for the LGBTQ plus supporters groups within those stadiums. You'll see very sort of visible presence of rainbow flags and, and other things that at the very least help you know as someone walking into that space that you're not the only one there. There are more allies than you probably know. There are more people that are willing to stand up and talk and most importantly, listen. I think we'll, we'll see a greater representation in the end, in the coming years, with the work that's being done at the youth level. For young players growing up, it's gonna make the game a lot better. When we do get to cases like male players coming out, let's not overhype it, let's not make a big massive deal of it, because then, you know, we're putting them under a lot more pressure than maybe they need to be. When these steps are made, they keep moving us down a path that in the long run, might get us to the place where it really wouldn't get someone any sort of backlash at all. It's going to be all right. There's going to be challenges, but the world is ready to, to accept you. And it's not going to be easy, but there's a place for you in the sport. My message to any LGBT people out there is go and support football. F football's ready for you. It's a sin.